Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon. What happens here? This is a show where I read something that I've never read before. George has put me together a script, which I don't have the title of because uh, apparently I didn't print it. <laughs> I don't even know what this is about. It is the- you, you probably know what the title is because you clicked on this video or this podcast and you saw it. I don't. I'm gonna read this and then Jen, our wonderful editor, is going to add some uh, images and some music and, and stuff like that afterwards. Uh, welcome to the show. Please leave a review if you're listening as a podcast. Consider clicking like. You don't have to yet, obviously. Especially if you're new here and you've never listened to the show before. In which case, you might be wondering what's going on. Well, it's a true crime show. Sort of, isn't it? Let's go. This is big. <laughs> Look at this. What is going on? For everyone listening, I just lifted up the script and uh, it's, it's substantial. It's the 9th of June, 1991, on Mutwa Street. Mu Wu. Oh my god, really? That's how you pronounce it. George provides me these pronunciation guidelines. And what looks like Mutwa Street looks to be Wu Hua Street. How is that M a W? Wu Hua Hua. This is crazy. Chinese language. What's up? Okay, look, they're on this street. Anyway, it's in Hong Kong with like six words in. Come on, whistle boy, get it together. The relentless and merciless summer heat is beating down on the endless wave of human traffic that fills the pavements. People plod slowly through the streets, jammed shoulder to shoulder, finding themselves unable to rapidly advance through the oddly tightly packed streets. Even without the horrendous humidity that adds laborious effort and discomfort to every step taken and every breath drawn. The only thing that shines brighter than the sun on this hot day is the glistening gold that stuffs the windows of many of the jewelers that ply their trade in this district i find just humid i don't mind heat i don't mind cold but i hate humidity i don't like it when it rains i don't like when it's cold and i don't like it when it's super humid in the air when it's hot because you just get sweaty and uncomfortable if it's just dry heat you're like all right it's hot but when it's like humid you're like oh i'm sweating like a beast i actually went to it's not well not hong kong i went to china a few years ago it was unbelievably hot the whole time i was there like 40 degrees celsius and i was just there's there's some photos i went with a mate and there's just some photos of us and it's just like we're just outside and our shirts are just covered in sweat and it's just like this is nuts it's like you just wanted to be inside it's like let's not go see anything let's just stay inside it's so hot To you or me, dear viewers, all of these stores would blend into much of a muchness, but for the subject of today's video, he was much more of a discerning customer, and he was looking for a very specific type of jewellery. But he wasn't looking for customer service, value, exclusive selections, or any other facet that you or me might use to stratify these seemingly carbon copy establishments from one another. No, he wanted a store with lax security. I feel like all the stores would get the security at the same place, wouldn't they? (laughs) Also, I'm really happy, like, dude, the last, I don't know what order these go out in, but the last two episodes that I've recorded, one of them was about that uh, Pedro guy in South America who murdered like 300 children, and the one before that was about Israel Keys, who was just some total psycho who was also murdering young people, and oh my god, George, if this is just about people robbing gold... I'm going to be so happy. I mean, not views-wise. Views-wise, the person who murdered 300 children gets way more views. Um, But I need these. I need these robbery ones. (laughs) Just in between, sprinkled in for my health. Because for God's sake, if I sat down and recorded another murder one, I think I would... uh, Well, it wouldn't be a good time. I'd probably go rob some gold. I can't do it anymore! (laughs) just turn into a criminal myself. Luckily, I've got all the rules for becoming a criminal, which you'll soon be able to purchase in a notebook, which will be coming out. That's right. I don't have a mailing list or anything, so just keep listening to the podcast and you'll find out when that's available. Not very good at marketing. (laughs) Let's go. The Chow Tai Fook was such a store. As the clock ticked past 1300 hours, the store was all but silent, save for gentle conversation between customers and colleagues, the muffled ambience of the street beyond the bounds of the store's windows, and the mellow drone of the air conditioning compressors working to keep that blistering summer heat at bay. Ah, (laughs) the sweet, sweet air conditioning. This serenity was shattered in an instant when the store's heavy glass door was fiercely barged open and slammed into a thick mahogany display case with a deafening crack that cut through the building. Customers and colleagues alike snapped their heads in the direction of the sound and saw five heavily armed men pouring into the building. Fear filled their beings as the realization dawned on them. 
it was a robbery. The robbers were dressed in the uniforms of their illicit profession, trainers on their feet, jeans on their legs, thick winter clothes on their coats, on their torsos, balaclavas on their faces, sports bag over their shoulders, pistols on their hips, and AK-47s in their hands. I mean, I guess the uniform of their profession. These are si automatic weapons? That is a serious robbery. And also, like, trainers make sense. That's pretty clever. But, dude, isn't it, like, a million degrees outside? You're wearing thick winter coats? Is that necessary? Does that, like, hide your gait or something from cameras? The man leading the charge into the store raised his rifle to the ceiling and clamped his finger on the trigger. A storm of 5.56mm bullets unleashed from the terrifying implement's muzzle and a snowstorm of dislodged plaster fell gracefully from the now porous ceiling as everyone inside dropped to the ground and dived for cover. Men and women alike began weeping as they shoved their hands into their ears with every ounce of strength that they could muster, desperately trying to stop the deafening ringing that was now consuming their focus. This was exactly what the robbers wanted, of course, who, having caused suitable chaos, could now set about securing their loot undisturbed. All the men lunged at specific cabinets, never tripping over each other or getting in each other's way before driving the butts of their rifles through the thin sheet of annuals? Annuals? Annual glass? It's a brand new word to me and my big brain. Uh, that stood between them and their payday. They lay their arms in the amalgamation of precious jewelry and broken glass that now lay on the cabinet and swept it into their bags. Then the gang rotated clockwise to fresh cabinets like a well-oiled machine and repeated and repeated once more until the store was completely picked clean of valuables with all the subtlety and grace of a vulture picking apart a fresh carcass. I mean, I have to say, they do seem, I mean, it's not graceful because they're smashing open the glass and stuff, but it does seem fairly well oiled. Like, they all go in, five of them. In in my mind, this is like one of those really small gold stores. Maybe this is a bigger gold store or whatever, but I imagine them all in the small space. They all know exactly where they're going. They all rotate one position right, and they all very efficiently rob it. There's no shouting at each other. There's no nothing. It's just boom. Everyone knows exactly what they're doing, which honestly is exactly how it should be. You see me doing thrill seeker liquor store hold up, sort of born to lose tattoo on my chest. I'm always saying, especially with the robberies and stuff, yo, if you're gonna do a big robbery and there's gonna be a big, big payday, invest some time into getting it right. You know? You're not stealing a car radio so you can sell it for drugs here. It's the most 90s reference that I've ever made. But you're like professional criminals. This is good. You're doing a good job so far. Okay. <laughs> I feel like in the last two videos, we could have said anything good about the horrible scumbag criminals. So in this one, it's like, good robbers. Skilled. Competent. I mean, it's not good to endorse robbery, is it? But it's just so much like lighter than last week's material. I mean, for me, recording at least. Woof. Outside of the store, a panic was ensuing. The initial burst of fire as the gunmen entered the store reverberated across the entire street. The concentrated mass of pedestrians, previously squeezed onto the tight pavement, pavement diffused across the road as they began fleeing in all directions. This panic continued to crescendo outwards across the... Looking at my pronunciation guide... Kwantong Street... Uh, Kwantong District, sorry. And soon, even people out of range of the deafening reverberation joined the fleeing crowd. The fleeing crowd was soon noticed by the officers of the Kwantong Police Station, which just sat a couple of hundred meters away from Mutwa Street. I know that it's pronounced differently, but I'm not going to go uh, Wu Hua Street. Why is something spelt? And I'm sure there's a reason. It's just I don't speak Mandarin. Hong Kong? Cantonese? They say Cantonese in Hong Kong. That's right, isn't it? Mandarin's like mainland China, and then Cantonese is Hong Kong. Anyway, look, Cantonese, maybe, who knows? But why is it, why is something spelt M U T W A H pronounced Wu Hua? Oh, God, who knows? Let's carry on. <laughs> Superintendent James Elms, who happened to be in the station eating lunch, raced out into the street and began pushing through the fleeing crowd to try and find the source of the panic. The crowd quickly thinned as they followed the trail, and within a matter of minutes, he found the presumed source, the ominously empty Mutwa Street. Ah, oh, goddammit, Wuhua Street. Look, if I pronounce it wrong, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just written completely different, isn't it? He drew his revolver and after radioing for backup, began cautiously advancing into the street. He hugged the exterior walls on his left flank for some semblance of cover and moved forward, slowly 
and hesitantly peering into alleys, shop windows, and under cars, having absolutely no idea what he was expecting to find or where he expected to find it. Suddenly he saw it. A balaclava shrouded head poke out of a jewelry store door. It pivots from left to right, right, quickly surveys the street, and disappears back into the store. Not wanting to escalate a potential hostage situation, he did all he could do. He continued to hug the wall and close the distance as fast as he could without making so much noise as to announce his presence. I feel like, yeah, this is a pretty good plan. Like, if you, I, I would think the guy would just rush into it or call for back or all of this stuff. But this is a really, this is some solid policing. Be like, yo, 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 if they're just robbing it, there's probably people in there. Let's just not have the police shop. Let's just let them leave the building. Because, I mean, yes, it's bad, they stole all the stuff, but it's better than having a hostage situation, isn't it? So just let them leave, and then try and catch them later. That seems to make sense. Hopefully they won't take any hostages with them. In that case, obviously, that's a mistake. But I think this is quite a good plan so far. Superintendent Elms wasn't particularly phased at this point. He expected this to be a simple smash-and-grab robbery, the kind of dull affair which typified armed robberies in Hong Kong in this period. One or two guys with hammers hit pounce on them, they'd either surrender or get shot, and he'd be back at the station before his cup noodle lunch was even cold. What he was not expecting was for five men carrying automatic rifles to erupt onto the street. Yeah, dude, you've got like one little revolver, you're one cop against five dudes with automatic weapons? It's a, that's a... That's a big fight. That's your screwed. Unfortunately for Superintendent Elms, his police uniform was a familiar sight for the hardened criminal gang who spotted him immediately. They had planned for exactly this eventuality. Calmly, one of the gang, no more than 20 yards away, makes eye contact with him, raises his AK-47, points the muzzle squarely at him, and squeezes the trigger. Elms, who fortunately had not been hit in this opening volley, returns the favor and emptied the modest six-round cylinder of his 38 caliber Smith & Wesson Model 10 revolver towards the bandits. They've got automatic five guys with AK-47s, fully auto weapons with God knows how many rounds in that magazine. And he's got six bullets, six small bullets in his Smith & Wesson revolver. The men begin to turn fire, but only could only get a few rounds off before the barrels of their rifles are quickly thrown down by the leader of the gang, who gestures for them all to hurry up and follow him. The group sprints towards a final store and piles inside, but this time two remain outside. With military precision, the two gunmen take up parallel positions on the street, one in each lane of the road. And they drop to one knee for stability and lay down suppressive fire whenever Superintendent Elms pokes his head above the car that he's taken cover behind. Dude, you've got no bullets left. You emptied it. So, I mean, maybe he has a spare light revolver cylinder in his pocket or whatever. But dude, know you're outgunned. Call in hong kong swat and leave it's okay you make me sound like a coward and i'm not a coward no one thinks you're a coward you're just making the sensible move maybe that's not what policemen are supposed to do but i would be the f out of there <laughs> Fortunately for Superintendent Arms, those reinforcements it radioed for earlier began to arrive. Officers in cars and vans planted their right feet to the floor as they tore towards Mutwa Street. Engines screaming against their red lines and dismounted officers arrived on the scene with empty lungs and blistered feet at every available, as every available officer radioed to save their pinned-down comrade. The thieves have other ideas, however, and fire upon any officer who enters within the range of their beastly implements. The arriving officers are armed with the same 38 caliber revolver as Superintendent Elms and are completely outmatched by the superior firepower of the bandits. They form a roadblock at both ends of the street and wait, unable to rescue Elms or stop the robbery. Twenty men and counting are being held off by two. The police tactical unit, PTU, and the special duties unit, SDU, are attempting to push through to the scene with heavy weaponry. Ah, it's Hong Kong SWAT! But the powerful Mercedes and Audis carrying them are restricted to a walking pace by the afternoon gridlock of the Kowloon Peninsula. Their base is too far away from the scene for them to be accessible by foot. The thieves are finally satisfied after clearing their fifth jewelry store on the street. <laughs> Why don't just do one at a time? Just do one, go away, and then come back the next week or the next year and do the next one. It's just something I do. I love stealing things. Doing five at once is brazen. The two men on the street are joined by two more who likewise take to their knees and begin taking pot shots at the police lines, gentle spirited reminders that they were woefully outgunned and were to stay back if they didn't want to finish their shift in a casket. The fifth man ran to a small microvan parked in front of Chow Tai Fook. He throws his bag in the back, starts it up, and swings it around in a violent J turn and parks it in the middle of the defensive line 
that the men had formed. Methodically, the men take it in turns to one by one throw their bags in the back, jump into a seat, and then provide covering fire from the van for the next man who repeated the process. The final man, the gang leader, leaves the police to parting gifts before jumping into the van, his middle finger, and the rest of the magazine, which he sprays wildly into the police lines. The tiny vehicle then takes off down the street with all the haste its microscopic engine could muster, it turns into a small alley the police had overlooked, and it disappears. I'm kind of impressed that they managed to get away. It's like this has been like fully surrounded, and you're in the middle of a city, and they just whoosh, sneak away. I mean, wow. <laughs> The entire saga didn't even last 15 minutes, and in that time, the gang fired 54 rounds at the police, robbed five stores, made off with 5.4 million Hong Kong dollars, about $700,000 in jewelry. Ah, uh, it doesn't. I know it's a lot of money. I know $700,000 is a lot of money, but is it really? Like you, you robbed five jewelry stores. Don't those stores get robbed in London and France and stuff? And it's like the guys make off with like millions, tens of millions of pounds or dollars or euros or whatever worth of jewelry this doesn't seem like that big of a heist but they got five stores also you shot at police and you managed to secure you got five ak-47s from somewhere those are black those black market guns have got to be expensive let's say they're like five grand each because i just watched a movie where they were buying black market guns uh let's say they cost like five grand like off you know secret guns or whatever you know like you can't just go into a gun shop and buy them let's say that's like 25 grand right there and your return's only 700,000. Is this a high enough return thing for the risk? You're also shooting at the cops. That's going to get you in big trouble. They take that seriously. It is the risk we all took. It was carefully planned and expertly executed by a master criminal gang. The man who he had barking orders at the robbers and unceremoniously giving his opinion figure to the police follow, uh, before making his escape was their leader. His name was Yip Kai Foon. Got a note here. Yip Kofun is actually a horrible transliteration of his name, but it's the one that's most uh, that's most familiar, so I deemed it most appropriate. In Mandarin, it'll be pronounced as Yi Ji Wan, Wan, Yi Ji Wan, instead of Yip Kofun. That is totally different. Oh my god! Like I learned Czech. I'm not learning Czech currently because I'm taking a little bit of a break because it got quite intense and I've got a busy life. But I think that language is quite difficult. It's like it's not easy. People say it's a difficult language. And then it's like Mandarin. So it, maybe they do speak Mandarin in Hong Kong. I thought, I, I don't know. George lives in Hong Kong, by the way, if we didn't know. Um, I thought, I thought that was difficult. But this Mandarin, my, my. <laughs> he was Hong Kong's most infamous and dangerous gangster. And he was a man who stole millions of dollars with the use of an AK-47. And this is his story. Wow, George, you are competing with Danny for long introductions on that one. That's like, I mean, it's not really an introduction, it's like a cold open. That's like three and a bit pages. Early life. You'll often read articles and watch documentaries regarding Yip Kai Foon, which claim his formative years are unknown, wrapped in mystery, and they're elusive. This is not the case, and in fact, we have a remarkably detailed understanding of the man's early life. I, George, discovered this through the use of a small but ingenious research hack that I like to call reading the Chinese sources. <laughs> George, I, I, I'm assuming you read Mandarin then, which is, I know, I, I don't know if you were born in Hong Kong or like what your story is, but. I'm still impressed with that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> There's those random videos, like one random video that came up. You know how you're sometimes just browsing YouTube and you get the most random shit on your homepage? There's one where it's like, random white guy orders perfect Chinese in Chinese restaurants. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's, it's like some spy shit, right? It's like where someone suddenly just knows, like, it, like a J it's some Jason Bourne. It's like Jason Bourne style, just because you don't expect it. Born in, and I also uh, I also do like how this one and the last one, where David found some detail, it's like, yo, all the stuff on the internet in true crime says this. But I actually looked into it, and it's not true. Like, the guy, uh, he was getting interrogated, and it all, like, tons of sources online said that it was he was a pastor, like, he was a religious guy. And it's like, no, 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 his name is pastor. Like, his first name is pastor. That's all. I like it when we go deeper. Born in 1961 in Shanwei City, Guangdong Province, a young, oh god, there's Shanwei, Shanwei Shi, is that Shanwei Si? Shanwei Si, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh god, it's so Guangdong, Shanwei Si, Guangdong, I'm so sorry everyone. Uh, anyway, so there's this place in Hong Kong, or is it, no, it's Guangdong Province, Shanwei City. 
I have no idea. Oh my. A young, anyway, y- young Yip Kai Foon, whose name isn't even Yip Kai Foon. <laughs> ah! I uh, was born into the tragically typical poverty that defined many Chinese lives before post Mao socialism with Chinese characteristics reforms transformed the country into the economic juggernaut that it is today. His childhood, I think I've brought this up before, but I went to China in like 2009, 2010, and then I went again 10 years later, basically. I was like, oh my God, the difference was insane. Even in 2009, China was fairly rich and developed. And then I went back, but it was, you know, not everyone's on iPhones. Well, no, well iPhones really, they weren't really around yet. But then you, I just went back like 10 years later. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it went from like regular to like, oh, okay. So, I mean, this, that, it's rich. It's like this whole part. I mean, the, 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 the coast, the East Coast is like, yeah. I'm sure China's like overall because there's so much poverty in the, or I don't know about poverty. There's poverty in China still. Yeah, for sure. But like it's in like the rural regions, it's much different. But it was like that east coast is like these are big rich cities it was intense his childhood home had straw on the floor mud in the walls dirt on the floor and no running water or electricity he received a basic education at a small community school in the then village of shangquo his education continued until 1970 when the destructive winds of the cultural revolution arrived at his small village we aren't sure exactly what happens after then all we know is that in 1971 there were no more teachers to continue the young kai foon's education and his studies stopped after the primary three level Yip Kai Foon's paper trail disappears at this point, so there's therefore little, if anything, known about his later childhood and teenage years. We can, however, have a reasonable guess that it wasn't exactly a period overflowing with joy, happiness, and prosperity for the young man. Likely he engaged in petty criminality and generally did what he had to do to support his family in those difficult times. Eventually, he made the same choice many southern Chinese men made in that period. He went to the economically verdant and bountiful lands of Hong Kong to make his fortune. Arrival in Hong Kong and Early Crimes A 17-year-old Yip Kai Foon arrived in Hong Kong in 1978 as an illegal immigrant, and for a time he tried to lead an honest and law-abiding life, before eventually being seduced by the swift and ample paydays that came with a career in armed robbery. (laughs) Ah yes, the temptations of armed robbery. (laughs) So, man, crime must be stressful. Like, I get it, like, you know, armed robbery is like, yeah. You know, it's a really good way to. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good way. You're going to make a lot of money very quickly, but it's also dangerous, and you can end up in prison. Risk versus reward. When he arrived, he took up employment at a fan factory owned by Lu, pronunciation guide Li Wu Lang Shong, Li Wu Lang Shong, a famous and very successful business magnate who still operates in Hong Kong in the present day. According to Liu Lang Shong, Yip Kai Foon was a very professional and hard-working employee. He always arrived on time, always worked hard, took very little sick leave, and he didn't join his fellow employees on strike. And I have a note. Yip Kai Foon left a very positive impression on this guy after his arrest and imprisonment in 1996. Spoiler alert! Uh, Li, Liu Lang Shong donated amply to Yip Kai Foon's defense fund. He also financially supported Kai Foon's wife and daughter following his arrest, paying off their mortgage on the mainland, and funding his daughter's law degree. That's cute. Well, that's super kind. You must have made a really good impression. Also, I, I'm assuming you just went to, to prison later for robbery. You didn't become like a worse criminal. Although shooting at the police, I'm like, you could kill them. That's not good. Yip Kai Foon did not keep up this honest streak for long, however, friends of Kai Foon, who spoke to the press in the years following his downfall, spoke of two major push factors that drove Kai Foon into the life of violent crime that made him famous. <laughs> I'm gonna guess one of those things is money! The first quite pragmatic reason was that Yip Kai Foon had accumulated a series of eye-raisingly large gambling debts. To say nothing of his financial obligations to his family back home, therefore he needed money. He needed it now, and robbery provided an obvious means by which to acquire large sums of money very quickly. The second, more abstract reason was that Yip Kai Foon gradually became consumed by bitterness due to his poverty and the seemingly lavish luxury all of his fellow Hong Kongers appeared to enjoy. He, after all, was a child of peasants, and he never got the opportunities that many others took for granted, and now he was fighting for scraps, both literally and figuratively, in a city whose wealth was expanding exponentially. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's got to be pretty hard. Like, is that keeping up with the Joneses thing? It's got to be pretty hard. When, like, you're a peasant and everyone around you is super rich. And then you're like, oh, man, I wish I was super rich, but I don't have any useful skills. (laughs) I guess I better get into crime. 
every time you just go just go home and feel like good among it's like i don't know the idea of like the 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 big fish in the small ponds that's kind of nice isn't it isn't that better isn't that like a better recipe for happiness i know it's, it's probably not a better recipe for success because obviously if you're like in a super competitive environment it's like yeah like i don't know like i don't know really any other youtubers i mean vaguely that i meet occasionally and like conferences and stuff but it's like yeah i'm definitely the biggest youtuber i know <laughs> But if I lived in a city where there were loads more and they were way more successful than me, I'd be like, oh man, come on, <laughs> what the hell? But I don't know, it's, uh, it would pro- I'd probably be like, I'd work more <laughs> and I work a lot already. Every time he left his communal, tiny communal dormitory, he would be greeted with the sight of a Rolls Royce, a Ferrari, a Louis Vuitton handbag, and it appears the resentment that built up was simply too much for him to bear. If he couldn't get the luxuries he craved through honest hard labor, he would take them. Yip Kai Foon's first known robbery was on the 10th of October 1984. He led a five man gang to the King Fook Jewelry Company in. Oh my god, that's. Oh my god, that. That's how you pronounce that, George? <laughs> it's spelt like Tsim Tsa Tsui, and it's pronounced Yi En Sha Sui. <laughs> what the hell's going on? It's, we're already translating, not translating, but Chinese is written in, like, characters. They're Chinese characters, right? You know the, you know what I mean? We're already translating them to, like, A, B, C, D alphabet. What's that? Is that the Roman alphabet? No. Latin alphabet? Something like that. That alphabet's got a name, like the regular alphabet that English is in. Why can't we at least make it phonetic, then? Why does it have to be all weird? And he executed a crude and unrefined version of the models that would come to dictate his robberies for the rest of his criminal career. The gang stormed inside the store, having chosen it for its weak security and proximity to viable escape routes, waved Soviet TT-33 pistols in the air, let off a few rounds, and while the staff were distracted with terror, smashed the display cases, threw the jewelry into sports bags before jumping into a stolen getaway car and disappearing before the police could respond. The second known robbery was on the 27th of October, 1984. Wow, that's like 17 days later. Bold, guys, bold. This time the ta- uh, target was the Dixon Jewelry Store in Central. Once again, the gang of five stormed inside, created havoc, stripped the store bare of jewelry, and fled before the police could even arrive on the scene. Between both of these robberies, over two million Hong Kong dollars, that's 250,000 US dollars worth of goods, was stolen. But Yip Kai Foon was still young, inexperienced, and naive. It wouldn't be long before he slipped up and was firmly behind bars. Arrest. The increasing audacity, frequency, and severity of Yip Kai Foon's robberies made him a major target for the Royal Hong Kong Police Force, who were hot on his tail to try and apprehend him and see this dangerous man removed from Hong Kong streets. Time and time again, the police's network of underworld informers would provide intelligence about Kai Foon trying to fence some of his plunder, but like a phantom, the man would have completed the sale and disappeared by the time officers uh, uniformed or otherwise arrived on the scene to hopefully catch him red-handed. While this cannot be verified with any other evidence, so take it with a pinch of salt, veteran officers uh, interviewed for the completion of this episode. What? George, I have to say, mad respect. I think you mentioned this in an email to me, and I completely forgot about it. But you did go and talk to people, and you dig, dig up all this stuff, and you read the original Chinese sources. It's really impressive stuff. I mean, I feel like I'm blowing my own horn here a little because it's my, you know, my show, and I present this, and like, look how right I am. But no, just credit to George here because that is above and beyond, and I, I, I love it. Thank you. They spoke of a rumor that Kai Foon even took to completing his sales outside of police stations. <laughs> bold. Whether this was due to some grandiose scheme about hiding in plain sight or simply an enormous pair of proverbial criminal testicles, no one could elaborate further. This would not last forever, however, and when whether due the arrogance of hubris, bad luck, or simple statistical inevitability, Yip Kai Foon's winning streak would come to an end, and a masterfully executed plainclothes police uh, sting operation would see him arrested before the end of the year. 
Two months after the King Fook Jewelry Store robbery, Commissioner of Police Roy Henry tasks officers Gregory Lamb of the Crime Intelligence Bureau to get the evidence to see the thief arrested and charged by any means necessary. The two converse, and over the course of several days, debate the merits of different approaches to snagging him. Gregory Lamb was overwhelmingly opposed to trying to catch him in the act, believing it to be too slow and too dangerous of an approach. Commenting in a later TV interview, he noted, When he committed these robberies, he and his gang are very well trained. They act quickly, and they can finish the job within a few minutes. The pair instead decided to attempt to intercept him while he was in the process of fencing his stolen goods, believing that he would be off guard, easier to subdue, and hopefully unarmed. Commissioner Roy Henry then formally greenlit the operation, allocated Gregory Lamb men and resources, and quipped about looking forward to hosting the armed robber in his cells. It's very bold, guys. <laughs> It's like, we're definitely going to catch him. It's like, okay, but what if you don't? Then it's embarrassing. Just, uh, I feel like it's better to just do it and then be like, look what we did. Yay. Rather than like, then if you don't catch him, everyone's going to be like, oh, what a loser. Maybe we should get a new police commissioner, shouldn't we? With few leads and little information to go on, Lamb starts making full use of his comprehensive network of underworld informants, ordering them to keep their ears to the ground for people and exchanges that fit the slim pattern of information that they do have. They know that their suspect is a Rolex man. 15. Note. Great taste. Yes! Yeah, I also like Rolex. Nice watch brand. After looking for some common threads in the inventories, <laughs> I like that George just left me a note being like, Rolex, classy. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, after looking for common threads in the inventories of stolen goods during raids and the types of jewelry stores that he hit, they also know that logically the stolen goods have to be fenced, as one can't exactly barter portions of Rolex watch for Big Macs and meant payments. Accordingly, they task their informants specifically to be on the lookout for questionably large quantities of Rolex watches being moved with questionable with questionably few authentication papers yeah that's gonna be because they've all got individual serial numbers right so aren't those ones all gonna be red flagged as stolen and then very hard to shift and i mean you're not gonna buy a rolex where the like without papers that sounds fairly risky <laughs> it's like i mean there's lots of fake ones and stolen ones Due to the extensive breadth and depth uh, with which the police networks of informants penetrated the dark underbelly of Hong Kong's criminal underworld, it didn't take long before Officer Lam found their man. Gregory Lam then set about assembling a crack plainclothes police team to pose as buyers and snare their suspect. Sergeant Lee Kuang Ming, uh, note exactly as you'd go to pronouncing it, Lee Kuang Ming, nailed it. A veteran police officer, already highly decorated for bravery, is chosen to lead the undercover operation. Now viewers, I could give you a suitably exciting and dramatic retelling of the arrest myself, but instead, as the knowledge, hungry, wrinkled brains that I know you are, I think you would all much rather hear this tale's conclusion from the horse's mouth. So let us hear it in Sergeant Lee Kwong Ming's own words. Okay. Quote, my direct supervisor finished the meeting and called me into the room. He told me that he has a mission for me. He said there is a case about selling stolen goods and we would like you to pretend to be the buyer in this mission. I was handed the money and my superior said, don't lose the money. This is a big responsibility. Give it your best and do it properly. <laughs> Very like laissez-faire police work, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, look, there's a guy who's stolen stuff. Go buy it off him, all right? Here's a big pile of cash. <laughs> Carry on. We met him and the robber said, only one person will come inside the car. So I walked him alone to the car with the money. My other colleague was a few meters away. I hand the bag to Kai Foon and thought maybe I should remove the money from the bag to distract his attention. I took $10,000 out and I said to the robber, look, here's the money. And I started counting it in front of him. But he was holding a gun and started looking around left to right. He used both hands to count the money. When I saw this, I thought it was a good chance. I made a dash towards him and tried to grab the gun from him. Then I shouted, don't move! Police! Then I put the gun to Yip Kai Foon's head and grabbed his hands. But he removed the gun and started firing. Bang, bang, bang. I told him, put your hands up, otherwise I'll shoot you. We kept fighting each other for a while. Bang, bang, bang. I put my hand on top of the gun to stop him, and it started bleeding. But still, I kept hitting the robber many times. Me and my colleague eventually subdued him. With that, Yip Kai Foon was finally behind bars. But not for very long. Oh, oh, we're getting a prison break. I love it. The Prison Break In 1985, Yip Kai Foon was sentenced to 18 years at Stanley Maximum Security Prison, built in... Got a note, sorry. 
Fun family connection. My great uncle, Sub Inspector Charles Goodwin, was the head of the criminal investigation department at Yamao Tei Police Station and was interned by the Japanese in Stanley Prison in 1941 before being killed in 1944, refusing to collaborate with the Kempeitai Occupational Force. That sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. There was a, I, I guess you didn't know him. It was the 1940s. Great uncle, though. That would make them the age of grandparents? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That's sad. I realized reading this, I don't know very much about Hong Kong. I know it was British until like 1997, but I only know one guy who was born in Hong Kong, but it was just because his dad worked there for a while. Um, but I guess it's like hot. Yeah, it's like old school. This is fascinating. I'd love to learn more about like <laughs> the lives of I, they're not British people, I guess. What is it? Hong Kongers? I don't know. It's so strange. I'm going to read more about that after recording this. <laughs> I feel like that's something I would know about, given how many videos I've read. But let's carry on. Built in 1937, this cathedral of incarceration was considered one of the finest correctional facilities in the British Empire. An 18-foot tall reinforced concrete wall flanked the facility on all sides, which was in turn dressed with lashings of razor wire and a healthy sprinkling of guard towers manned by the finest marksmen of the Hong Kong Correctional Services. It was highly staffed with one armed guard for every two inmates on shift at all times of the day. <laughs> you don't see that much. Like, normally it's like, yeah, the prison was designed for six people, and now there's 700,000. Oh, <laughs> typical. Even if you could escape from this imposing facility, where would you go? As you may know if you've ever consumed a single piece of media about the city, Hong Kong isn't exactly a city overflowing with space and handy secluded places one could hide from the law, with some districts of the city housing as many as 340,000 people per square mile. Good lord. Got a note, the district in question is Mong Kok, well worth a visit, as there's some great restaurants and nerd emporiums there now. I'd love to go to Hong Kong. I kind of can't believe I've never been. I, I should go. I mean, obviously, not in the near future, because I have two very small children. Uh, there's COVID. I haven't traveled for ages. <laughs> I'm really busy. <laughs> but at some point, in like 30 years, when I'm retired or something. <laughs> Maybe I won't be able to go there because it'll be like fully Chinese and they'll be like, no. <laughs> Last time I went to China, it was really difficult to get a visa. It wasn't difficult, but I had to go into the embassy for an interview because they were like, eh, I've told this story before, but anytime I have to apply for a visa, I, you know, especially to China, I don't write YouTuber in there because they don't have YouTube there. And that's just going to make people ask questions. So I just put advertising, I work, like advertising person, <laughs> like working advertising. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they didn't buy that. So they, they, took me in and they made me sign this thing saying I wasn't going to make any videos in, in China. I wasn't going to. I was just going on a trip. <laughs> it was a bit, bit more intense than I wanted it to be. This brief survey of the situation would no doubt discourage most of us from attempting to escape Stanley Prison. Certainly it would me as I happen to not be terribly partial to receiving large caliber rifle rounds to my back. <laughs> Such conclusions were not formed by Yip Kai Kaifun, however, who, on the 24th of August 1989, after serving four years of his sentence, decided the whole incarceration malarkey had just become somewhat irksome, and he was leaving. Like an apathetic yet wise high school student trying to bunk off school, Yip Kai Foon laid the groundwork of his excuses early, commenting to anyone who would heed him that he was suffering from a bit of dicky belly. From a bit of a dicky belly. Then, after a couple of days of no doubt superb acting, he clutched his stomach in mock agony and fell to the floor during a caged exercise. Uh, screaming and writhing in agony, the guards rushed over to Kai Foon's side. He articulated about agonizing, aching around his abdomen. Normally, all prisoners were taken to the custodial ward of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, but through damned luck, wouldn't you believe it, this ward happened to be full to capacity. So Yip Kai Foon was thrown on a stretcher and driven by ambulance to Queen Mary Hospital 10 miles away, on the other side of Hong Kong Islands instead, and placed into general admissions. If you'll allow me to don my tinfoil hat for a moment, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, I'm going to go out on a whim and guess that this was not in fact a coincidence, and may in fact have been planned by Kai Foon. What? You, <laughs> you don't say. Sometimes a conspiracy. This isn't a conspiracy. This is just a plot. <laughs> Uh, to prevent the obvious from happening, two armed police sergeants were placed at Yip Kai Foon's side 24-7 during his stay in hospital, and he was handcuffed to his bed. Surely, the senior wardens no doubt reasoned, he won't be pulling any naughtiness now. But as particularly astute viewers or listeners have no doubt deduced from the title of this chapter, naughtiness was 
in fact pulled. Yip Kai Foon claimed that he had to go to the bathroom. The guards hesitated, not sure if it was safe to remove their prisoner's shackles for even a moment. But eventually they acquiesced and, uh, to his request, and they wished to spare him the indignity of having to relieve himself in a bedpan without any physical ailment to force the need of one. What? <laughs> be like, if he doesn't have any physical ailment, then it's going to be very easy for him to just be like, yeah, grab that bedpan, go into the corner of the room, and pee in it. <laughs> Come on. I can't do it. He was escorted to the bathroom and insisted that he was going inside alone. <laughs> How is he getting away with this? As the door slid shut, <laughs> just, I don't understand, just turn your back. Just make him go into the stall, keep the stall door open, and be like, great, pee in the toilet. I'm going to be watching you from behind. I can't see anything. And even if I could, I'm a professional. Hey! Good job, buddy! That's okay. He'd be like, I can't go when you're looking at me. So don't go! Just go back to the room and do it in the bedpan. He's a bad criminal. <laughs> as soon as the door slid shut, all appearances of his supposed stomach ailment disappeared, and Kai Foon began frantically searching the bathroom for any possible means of escape. Immediately, he noticed the slim privacy window that sat just at the peak of the wall, high and small enough to afford a man his dignity and prevent passers-by from seeing his bowel movements, but just thin enough to allow some light into the room. Fortunately for Kai Foon, light was not the only thing that fit through this small window, and after some inelegant scrambling, he pulled himself through the window and dropped down onto the hard gravel of the hospital's perimeter path that sat outside. Oh my god, where are you going to go now, though? You've got, like, minutes to make a getaway, and then every police person in the city is going to be on your ass. This is fairly exciting. Yip Kai Foon immediately started sprinting away from the hospital. Unsure of his bearings, he bolted straight down a hill adjacent to the hospital until he found a road. He threw himself in front of a car occupied by a 37-year-old man and his 6-year-old son, who ironically had been headed to Queen Mary Hospital to pick up his wife. Kai Foon jumped inside and barked at the man to start driving anywhere but the hospital. They took the southbound road towards Aberdeen, a relatively sparse district on the western edge of Hong Kong Island. Yip Kai Foon took, also took the man's clothes. According to the man's police testimony, Kai Foon was surprisingly cordial during this encounter, although he did admit that due to prison fatigues that he was clad in, he decided the best course of action was to humor him and not try his patience. Yes, if someone has stolen your car and is being all violent and is wearing prison clothes as if they are on the run from a prison, give them your clothes and the car and just hope that everything will be okay, because they're in prison for a reason, probably because they're a violent criminal. Especially if they're escaping from prison. No one escapes from prison if they're in there for like I don't know, a year or two years. No one's like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll try escaping because then you're going to get way more time when they catch you, and they will catch you. Like, number of prison escapes where it's like, yeah, then they were never found. It's like basically zero. <laughs> After an impulsive change of plan, Yip Kai Foon ordered the car to stop at the Wong Chuk Hang en route to Aberdeen and jumped out of the car. He then apologized to the man for the inconvenience caused and lamented that on account of having just escaped from prison, he had nothing to offer the man to show his appreciation for the cooperation. Kai Foon then joined the back of a queue along the edge of the street, hopped onto the next bus, and disappeared. Now, just before we get into the rest of today's video, let me please thank today's sponsors. First of all, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of non-fiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. They've got millions of subscribers and they've got new shows being added every week on history, science, tech, military history and a whole lot more and they got so much stuff they, they're always saying we're adding new content every week and it's like how would you finish their huge library anyway but you know they're keeping it up to date they're adding new stuff um it's also available on many platforms look it, there's a huge list of them here but basically if you've got a screen that was made in the last i don't know five years ten years you're going to be able to download that curiosity stream app and get to playing also you can watch it on your smart tv of course or through chromecast all that good stuff um content is yeah like they say there's a huge list science nature history technology oh my god the list is vast what would i recommend i would recommend if you're enjoying casual criminalist you probably like that kind of investigative stuff definitely check out the show secret societies here's a little blurb by the way Secret societies play a far larger role in our everyday lives than we're aware of. This three-part documentary accompanies Dr. Marion Fussell on his search for clues surrounding history's most famous secret societies and conspiracy theories. Look, if you kind of like the investigative part of this show, you're gonna dig that on Curiosity Stream. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash criminalist for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non 
fiction series. And for you guys, just use the code CRIMINALIST. You get 25% off, which works out at $14.99 a year, which is just $1.25 a month, which is absurd value. I feel like, you know, even unnamed, more expensive streaming services are good value. $1.25 a month is what I would describe as absurd value. The criminal continues his crime caper. Immediately after his escape from prison, Yip Kai Foon went dark. Very little is known about his activities during this period, with police believing that he slipped across the mainland border and took refuge in his home in Haifeng. This is the thing. China's really big. Like, once you get onto that mainland, surely you could just disappear into the mountains or some tiny village somewhere. Like, Hong Kong police, it's like, good luck. Good luck. Here he had a large network of friends and family who protected him, sheltered him, and the lack of extradition treaty between Hong Kong and China in this period meant he could enjoy some rest and relaxation without having to constantly look over his shoulder. Wow. I guess that makes sense. Like, no extradition between Hong Kong and China. But that's pretty intense. You just cross that border, and it's like, yeah, you got in your jurisdiction, and China's not extraditing. <laughs> so, f*** you, Hong Kong. That's pretty intense. Non-extradition is weird. I mean, I get why it exists, because it's like, <laughs> countries are like, yo, your authority doesn't extend to my country. We've got to have a treaty. And sometimes those treaties don't get set up. But it is pretty intense. Like, you could just, yeah, once you're there, free man. <laughs> The China-Hong Kong border in this period was notoriously porous. It wasn't very long, but it was very complicated politically and geographically, which made it hard to police. Using Dai Fei, big flyer speedboats, highly modified speedboats stripped of their unnecessary weight and equipped with anywhere from four to eight very powerful outboard engines, Yip Kai Foon was able to essentially enter and leave Hong Kong entirely at his own leisure. Would you go back to Hong Kong? I don't think I would. I'll just continue my crime career elsewhere. Be like, yeah, I'm not from Hong Kong. There's plenty of other places I can do crime. And if I go back to Hong Kong, I escape from prison and I'm wanted. I'm going back to prison for a very long time. Whereas if I'm in China, they can't do d Why would I go back to Hong Kong? That seems super risky. It's also believed that during this period on the mainland, Yip Kai Foon acquired the AK-47s that would become so famously associated with his crimes. Contrary to what you will hear, uh, some articles state Kai Foon did not use Chinese-produced weapons, but Soviet ones. These weapons came into China following the Sino-Vietnam War, when unscrupulous mainland triads used the triads used the chaos of the war to secure caches of weapons from surrendered or war-weary Vietnamese forces. In June 1991, Yip Kai Foon returned to Hong Kong using the aforementioned Dai Fei speedboats to effortlessly slip across the border. Almost immediately after he committed the infamous Kwantong robbery we discussed at the start of this episode, which, lest we forget, saw Kai Foon rob five jewelry stores in a single day while facing heavy police resistance. This robbery saw a 1 million Hong Kong dollar, that's 128,000 US dollar, bounty put on his head, and he was formally listed as Hong Kong's most wanted man. Why are you doing this robbery in Hong Kong where you're already wanted? I guess because then, oh, okay, I kind of get it, because then if he can escape back to China, he's free again. So if he just does Hong all of his crimes in Hong Kong and then immediately escapes to China every time on one of these speedboats, that's actually quite a genius plan. I take back everything I said. This guy's one step ahead of me. The years 1991 to 1996 became a veritable orgy of robbery and criminality for Yip Kai Foon as he hit jewelry stores again and again and again. All his robberies fit the same pattern that we discussed in the introduction. Get some heavily armed, handy blokes, hit weakly defended stores, close to, fast, close to fast escape routes, hit them hard, hit them fast, and respond to any attempts to resist with volleys of furious 7.62mm AK-47 fire. Yip Kai Foon and his crew operated with military efficiency and professionalism. They were well trained, they were motivated, and their robberies were planned and practiced meticulously. Yeah, as we saw at the start, when they go in, they break those things and then they rotate. Ch -ch -ch, rotate. Ch -ch -ch. Easy. Hong Kong was mesmerized by Yip Kai Foon as his heists grew more and more audacious, and he grew into something of a criminal celebrity. Security footage of him brandishing a rifle is plastered across every single news station and newspaper. Teenagers, and youngsters in particular, became enthralled with Kai Foon's exciting criminal persona. Children in playgrounds spent their recesses reenacting his latest robbery with sticks filling the role of the veritable AK-47. The regulars of blue-collar drinking halls held toasts to Yip Kai Foon, whose targeting of the wealthy and relatively collateral damage-free robberies had made him something of an up-and-coming folk hero in certain cir circles. It is fascinating how we, like, romanticize violent criminals, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of weird. But I'm also like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the escape from prison and stuff. It's like, when he's not hurting anyone, you're like, oh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's bad. 
Fong Gong police pulled out all the stops attempting to bring Yip Kai Fu to justice and prove once and for all that there's no glamour in his lifestyle. The police tactical unit, a semi-elite branch of the police which received a higher standard of tactical training and whose officers were qualified to graduate from carrying revolvers to carrying submachine guns and automatic rifles, was allocated extra funding and saw its ranks swell. The special duties unit, a hyper-elite unit which blurred the line between SWAT team and military special forces unit, received crates of new cutting-edge weaponry and was sent to train with the SAS in the United Kingdom. Even regular officers on the beat carried Yip Kai Fun's photo at all time and were issued with extra compliments of ammunition for their revolvers in case they were to encounter him. His robberies during this period were too numerous for us to be able to examine each of them in depth. So now let's take a quick cursory look at all the known robberies that Yip Kai Fun can firmly be linked to. June the 9th, 1991, five jewelry stores are robbed in Kwantong. Quan, Quan Tong, I think. As discussed at the introduction, 54 shots were fired at the police, and the gang escaped with 5.7 million Hong Kong dollars, 700,000 US dollars in jewelry. 10th of March 1992, nearly a year later, Yip Kai Fun and his gang robbed two jewelry stores on Taipo Road, Shim Sha Po. 65 shots were fired at the police when they escaped with 3 million Hong Kong dollars. 385 US, 385,000 US dollars in jewelry. 6th of January 1993, Yip Kai Fun and his gang raid jewelry store on Nathan Road, Mong Kok. Uh, coincidentally, in the building where I lived when I first moved to Hong Kong. So George did move to Hong Kong, but then his granddad, his great great grand, his his great uncle was. Okay, George, your life is like, it's a mystery. It's exciting. I feel like you might be a spy. Get some rest, hey, Mom. You look tired. 6th of January, 1990. <laughs> There's a friend of mine. It's like, he's just the most mysterious guy. He's lived in all these different places. He's done all these different jobs. He has like four passports. And we just call him a spy. Because it's like, yeah. If anyone is... I mean, it's it, he's only not a spy because it would be way too obvious that he's a spy. But he's like, he's so spy-like. It's weird. And he has good reasons for having four passports. He's got like uh, parents of different identities. And then he was born somewhere else. And then he had another one for, I don't know why, but it's like, <laughs> it's complicated, but exciting. 6th of January, 1990, <laughs> it's like the opposite. I'm like, I have, I, well, I suppose I live in a different country, but I only have one passport because I, my check's not good enough to pass the, the Czech language test. Uh, 6th of January, 1993, Yip Kai Foon and his gang raid a jewelry store on Nathan. I read that already. I'm sorry. Did I? Oh no, I didn't. I, I did. I did. I don't know. Oh, here's where I were. We were talking about George's first house in Hong Kong. Or flat or whatever, I don't know. The houses in Hong Kong? I don't imagine with that population density, probably not many. 30 rounds are fired at the police and a female passerby is tragically killed. One of Kai Fun's accomplices is shot in the back of the head as the gang make their getaway. His body is dumped out of the fleeing car. The gang escaped with 2.5 million Hong Kong dollars, $320,000 in jewelry. Uh, 12th of May 1995, Yip Kai Fun, moonlighting with another gang, steals 29 million Hong Kong dollars, that's 3.75 million US dollars worth of gambling chips and cash from the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Macau. Kidnappings A popular man in Hong Kong's pre-handover underworld, Yip Kai Fun nurtured and grew a large network of trusted confidence and associates, which only grew exponentially with a man's own infamy. One such man in Kai Fun's network was one Chiem G. Oh my god. <laughs> you just see the pronunciation on that? <laughs> How is that even possible? Uh, Chiung Tsi Kyung. I know it's incorrect. I'm so sorry. A notorious Taiking kidnapper, robber, and arms smuggler in his own right, who Simon will hopefully be featuring in an upcoming episode himself in the not too distant future. Sounds rather exciting. 25. Note. His claims to fame include ransoming businesses and their families for over 2 billion Hong Kong dollars. That's like 200 million regular dollars, right? 2 billion minus. Yeah, that's about right. Good lord. Uh, over 200 million dollars worth of Hong Kong dollars of robbery from Kai Tak Airport. Oh my god, yeah. I mean, it would also be nice. I'm enjoying this, like, non-murdery one. <laughs> the last two I recorded before this. It's like, oh my god. You need, like, what do they call them? Mental health breaks. <laughs> Jesus. After formally becoming acquainted with one another in the summer of 1996, the two men quickly formed a deep and well-rooted fraternal bond <laughs> rooted in crime. Of common interests, such as drinking, gambling, women, robbery, and firearms. <laughs> it's like so serious. It's like stereotypical crime people, isn't it? 
Uh, more pertinently, Tsi Kyung shared Kai Fun's own personal grievance with the sparkling opulence of Hong Kong's bourgeois class, and the pair soon decided to take up arms, literally and figuratively, against Hong Kong's rich elite and began plotting kidnappings. <laughs> Do you guys not see the irony of that? Are you not like, wait, are we kidnapping people, rich people, so we could become rich ourselves? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit rich, isn't it? Like what you want to become. Accordingly, the two men sat down one night with a bottle of Baiju, uh, note, a very nice Chinese alcoholic beverage. I particularly recommend the five liter, two pound bottle of the state distilled stuff you can get at the mainland supermarkets. I have many fond and blurry memories on the mainland powered by that stuff. Five liters for two pounds? Was that like three dollars? For five liters? That's insane. That's dangerous. I always thought like the chi- <laughs> When I was a student, a friend of mine had this giant, it was like a three liter bottle of gin uh, from Asda. And I think it was like 15 quid or something, <laughs> three liters. I think that must, this must have been before there was some minimum tax on alcohol because that was crazy. It just, uh, he'd call it a sip and gin. It'd just like take little sips off it before going out <laughs> to save money, of course. But two pounds for five liters, that is, uh, that is a new record of cheap. Uh, they also had a copy of the Tintin Daily News, Hong Kong's rich list, and they began discussing the viability of each of them. <laughs> like a shopping list for kidnapping. It's like that that rich list, right? But also, it's all it's kind of all guesses and made up. I, when I was a kid, I always thought the rich list was like, yeah, of course we know how much everyone's worth. No, you don't. You don't at all. I mean, if they if you have like shares in a big public enterprise. Like, you know, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, Microsoft, um, Elon Musk and all this stuff. Like they'll, All of these guys, you can be like, okay, well, they've got that many shares in the company and each share is worth this much. So they're roughly worth $100 billion. But when it comes down to people who just own private companies, it's like you have no idea. Like no one knows how much money I, uh, how, how much I'm worth because also you don't know how much money I spend. <laughs> it's like, it's impossible. Like you can Google that. It's like, it's never right. It's never right. Henry Fock Ying Tung. Oh my God, another pro... Oh. Look, I'm just hoping that my pronunciation was close enough at this point, George. Was almost immediately discounted. Initially, Henry Fock uh, seemed like a most promising candidate for a kidnapping. He was worth just under 30 billion Hong Kong dollars, that's 3.8 billion US dollars, on account of his enormous property empire, and had a large number of loving family members and business, ex business dependents who would all be most interested in securing his swift and safe return. The problem was that Henry Fock was the vice chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Oh my god, that is a mouthful and a half. Oh my god, and it continues, of the People's Republic of China. <laughs> What's my note here? Sorry for the mouthful, Simon. <laughs> Added to by the note, I might add. Uh, having ascended to that position in March 1993. This made him very possibly the most powerful Hong Konger on the mainland, and I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, viewers, the pair did not relish the prospect of angering that proverbial dragon. Naturally, Henry Fock was immediately discounted. The next possible target they discussed was Lu Luengzhong, the guy from earlier whose pronunciation I'm absolutely certainly getting wrong, another wealthy property magnate who we have already met in today's episode. Yep. Kai Foon immediately voiced an objection to this. If you remember viewers back in 1978 when Kai Foon had first arrived in Hong Kong, one of his attempts at going straight and finding gainful employment was at a fan factory. Owns oh, I was this guy, is this guy. And he was very emphatic towards the young Kai Foon, making sure he had a place to, and he was very empathetic. Sorry, towards the young Kai Foon, making sure he had a place to stay, a stomach full of food each day, and generally helping him adjust to life in Hong Kong. Betraying this kindness was simply unacceptable to Kai Foon, and thus he was disqualified from further consideration. Yeah, good for you. I, like, Kai Foon, yeah, he's a robber, but he doesn't seem like a bad guy. He's kind of like, I can see why the people were like, yeah, he's a hero, even though he's robbing and shooting at police officers. But yay! <laughs> he's a hero compared to the last people in the episodes who were just monsters. Ultimately, however, all of this pontification was rendered moot, and Yip Kai Foon would never be able to add kidnapping to his criminal resume, as it was the midst of planning this operation, it was in the midst of planning this operation, that Kai Foon was finally arrested once for all and placed behind bars. Really? There's like a good ten more pages left today, George. I wonder where this goes. It's the cold read, everybody. I am discovering all of this with you. Isn't it a joy? Final arrest. 
On the 13th of May 1996, a nimble Dai Fei boat was cutting its way through the waters off the Hong Kong Peninsula, headed for the Chinese mainland towards the Kennedy Town district of Hong Kong Island. It was a typical smuggler's craft of the period, a hulking and powerful speedboat, once a prestigious status symbol for a Hong Kong playboy, corrupted and bastardized for an altogether more malicious purpose. Its bourgeois teak but decking had been discarded to lighten the craft, making it faster and help it outrun the maritime police. Its soft and thick leather seating had been stripped away to create more space for the various illicit cargoes carried by the criminal courier in command of the craft. Oof, mouthful again. Inside were three men, helmsmen driving and two men resting. This still happens, by the way, in December 2021. The maritime police sees 1.25 tons of ketamine. Damn, from a speedboat trying to jump the border. That's, yeah, I mean, smuggling happens all the time, of course. I, that one thing, though, like, outrunning the police. Does this actually happen? Because you see it in movies and stuff where people are like, yeah, I can speed because I can outrun the police. It's like, you can't outrun a camera, can you? They're going to take a picture of you and it's going to show your license plate. And they would be like, not only did you get a speedy ticket, but you tried to escape us. That's got to be a more serious crime, right? So don't you just get, like, a thing in the post being like, yo, here is a big ass fine or uh, here is a big ass go to court. <laughs> the maritime police presented no threat at all, as is previously alluded to. As always, the meager and underpowered boats provided to them by the British couldn't keep up with the highly customized criminal craft, and they simply glided past any officer who attempted to intercept them. Propped up against the port side of the vessel was the familiar figure of Yip Kai Foon. Bored with this troublesome chore of having to jump the border by boat, this was now routine for Kai Foon. For uh, what for most would be a stress-inducing endeavor, it was for now no more exciting or adrenaline-inducing than a typical Hong Kong businessman's morning commute crammed on an MTR subway car. Yip Kai Foon was wrong to be complacent, however, as the day would close with him firmly behind bars, never to be free again. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> day, uh, being used to danger doesn't mean that it's not dangerous anymore. Like, I don't know, if you're like a skydiver, you've done it a hundred times, you're like, yeah, it's exciting, but I don't, you know, it doesn't provide the same adrenaline rush as it did the first time. Still dangerous, though, isn't it? Although skydiving is probably not particularly dangerous. But, like, insert dangerous activity here. Just because you got used to it doesn't mean it's, you know, less dangerous. That's, like, extra danger. From past discussions about the Hong Kong police's response to Yip Kai Foon's crime spree, you may be expecting his downfall to be the result of some masterly planned and masterfully planned and executed sting operation executed by Hong Kong's bravest and most experienced officers. But no, instead, Yip Kai Foon's downfall came from that most fearsome facet that even the most fastidious fellow is powerless to prevent bad luck. The smugglers had chosen a normally quiet and secluded spot, far away from the bustling urban sprawl that filled most of Hong Kong Island to land at. Unfortunately for them, three regular police officers just happened to be patrolling by where they noticed the familiar uh, silhouette of a Dai Fei boat heading for the wharf ahead of them. They ducked down, kept low, and quickly formed a perimeter around the wharf before the boat made land. They took position behind the most solid cover they could find among the industrial bric-a-brac that littered the area and waited. The sergeant leading the group ordered them to draw their revolvers and stay hidden, using his hands to silently communicate orders to his men as the boat moored close by. He peered through a crack in the crate that he was hiding behind. Not wanting them to escape, he waited for the men to turn off their engine and fully secure their boat to the quay before making his move. Then, when the moment was right, he gripped his revolver firmly in his right hand, got eye contact with his men, held up his left hand, all five fingers extended, and began to silently count down with them. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> With the coordination of a crack military drill team, the officers leapt to their feet and began barking orders to the men. Please get down on the ground now! Two of the three men did exactly that. One dropped to his knees and placed his hands on his head, and the other held out his arms and lay face down on the quay. Yip Kai Foon, however, was not feeling so compliant. He leapt back onto the boat, ducked behind the port side of the vessel, grabbed an AK-47, which fortunately had a, few ma a full magazine and he cocked it. The police, unaware of the impending danger, moved in to secure the two surrendered men and find Yip Kai Foon. They were <laughs> they not expecting him to have a gun? He's like famous for having guns. 
They were unable to reach any of them before Yip Kai Foon raised the muzzle of his rifle and welded his finger to the trigger. In a rare moment of unprofessionalism for Yip Kai Foon, he emptied the 30 round magazine in one single burst, dragging the weapon from side to side, attempting to hit as many of the officers as possible. As terrifying as this no doubt was for the officers, it was most fortunate that Yip Kai Foon lost his cool and emptied his magazine at them. From my own personal experience on the fun and scary side of 7.62mm AK rifles, George, what is your life? You've been on the scary side of an AK-47? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And on the fun side? I can understand. Am I misreading that? Or does that mean you've been shot at <laughs> by an AK-47? What is your life? I don't remember. Firing them automatically renders them rather inaccurate. You are a spy. Does the first round will go where you want, and the rest will go where they want. <laughs> Fortunately, this meant the officers were able to dive for cover. And by the time Yip Kai Foon had inserted a fresh magazine into the rifle and cocked it, uh, once again all three officers were behind solid cover and emptying the cylinders of their revolvers towards him. In this shootout, the officers' revolvers were at less of a disadvantage than they had been previously. They were much closer to their assailants than officers in the past had been, and they had more solid cover than him. The exchange of fire continued so ferociously that the bright stream of muzzle flashes could be seen on the other side of Victoria Harbour. It took three rounds to bring down Yip Kai Foon. The first impacted his lower torso after he took his attention off the officers for just a second to tell his criminal companions to escape. The second impacted in his side, just below his armpit, as he left himself vulnerable during a mistimed magazine swap. The third round impacted in his lower torso and lodged in his spine. Uh oh, like lower torso? That's bad news. Armpit? Okay, it's bad news, but it's not the worst. Spine? Spine is bad. Spine is not good. Yip Kai Foon screamed out in pain as the first round landed, and his screams only crescendoed as his body continued to be torn apart by an avalanche of 38 specials. Finally, after the third round, he could take no more. He threw his rifle down to the floor, bellowed, F*** it, I surrender, and collapsed into a heap on the floor. He would never walk again as that final round left him paralyzed below the waist. The police rushed Yip Kai Foon to hospital. Alarmed by the amount of blood he was losing, they secured the boat and they dispatched search teams to try and find the other two men who had escaped. Inside the boat, they'd find the usual mountain of cascading white powder that one would expect in a smuggler's boat and a cache of Soviet-produced weaponry, including pistols, rifles, and two kilograms of explosives. <laughs> this is so. Wait, this smuggling boat. I always felt like smugglers would specialize. Like, if you're smuggling, you know, you smuggle cocaine, or you smuggle weed, or you smuggle guns, or you smuggle people. But these smugglers, they're like, no, 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 we smuggle everything. It's like, yeah, 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 we'll take the explosives, and the guns, and the drugs, and the person. Yeah, we'll do it all. We're like, uh, general purpose smugglers. Trial and death. Your gut is probably telling you now, dear viewers, that Yip Kai Foon's story is coming to a close, and indeed, you would be correct in that guess. Kai Foon was now paralyzed below the waist, and the Hong Kong Correctional Services certainly had no intention of allowing him to repeat his escape. Despite his now permanently handicapped state, he was surrounded by officers armed with military arms and armor every moment of his remaining life. Having a look at period press footage from the trial, you'll notice no reporters mobbing the windows of his armored prison van for photos because the police were under orders to shoot anyone on sight who even approached the van. His trial began in February 1997, and shockingly, prosecutors find that there's a lack of evidence to firmly link Yip Kai Foon to all of the robberies. No one was ever arrested for these crimes, and no damning evidence was ever recovered from the crime scenes, meaning that ultimately it actually proved to be quite difficult to nail him beyond reasonable doubt for those robberies. Yeah, but he shot at police officers. Isn't that enough? Just get him on something else. Instead, prosecutors opted for the Al Capone model of prosecuting. Ah, yeah, okay, exactly. Get him for something else. Look, we all know it's him anyway, so let's just stack what charges we can absolutely prove against him and nail the bastard. And admittedly, I, George, am no lawyer, ladies and gentlemen, but that sounds perfectly agreeable to me. Yeah, it sounds fine. Look, if you can't get him for the other stuff, and there's plenty of stuff to get him on, get him on that. Instead, he was charged with using firearms to resist arrest, possession of unlicensed explosives, and escaping from custody. After a month-long trial, Yip Kai Foon was sentenced to 41 years in prison in March of 1997 and is sent back to the familiar walls of Stanley Prison. Kai Foon would never taste freedom again because as much as the spirit was surely willing, he was now a broken man and he lived out his remaining years 
behind bars. That's not to say that his prison time was uneventful, however. Quite the contrary. In 2003, he got married in prison. He was allowed the pleasure of wearing civilian clothes for an entire day, and clad in his finest suit, he exchanged vows with the mainland Chinese woman. The pair divorced uh, on August 25th, 2015, after 12 years of marriage, which, to be honest, I think is quite good for a marriage that had to be consummated through steel bars. No, they... No. No, I don't... I don't but really? <laughs> On May the 23rd, 2006, he was returned to court once again after being found to be the ringleader of a prison smuggling operation. <laughs> It's not really surprising, is it? Which, through the use of corrupt prison wardens, snuck in sizable quantities of mobile phones, drugs, and other paraphernalia into Stanley Prison. He denied these charges, but was nonetheless found guilty of four charges of smuggling illicit goods into prison. In April 2009, he was convicted of assaulting prison warden Gu Yanqi, who he claimed had been mistreating him and violating his dignity. Despite pleas of mitigating circumstances and self-defense, he was found guilty of these charges also. He continued to appeal his sentence on humanitarian grounds, eventually getting his total sentence reduced to 36 years. He's still, he's still in there forever, isn't he? Uh, these efforts were ultimately pointless, however. Yip Kai Foon was diagnosed with lung cancer in the late 2000s, and as he proved unresponsive to treatments, his physical form became weaker and weaker with every passing moon. It was obvious that the inevitable was looming. In November 2016, Yip Kai Foon filed a complaint with the Hong Kong High Court regarding his being denied traditional Chinese medicine by the Hong Kong Correctional Services. This ruling actually ended up setting a precedent about Hong Kong prisoners' rights to access traditional Chinese medicines should they wish for it. If this chapter has so far given you the impression of a raging bonfire gradually dimming down to the thin flicker of a candle light, that was very much intentional. Yip Kai Foon was weakening, and he was not long for the world. On the 1st of April 2017, he was rushed once again to Queen Mary Hospital after complaining about agonizing pain, and the correctional ward proved unable to stabilize his condition. But this time, there was no prison break, no hijinks, no escape. His condition continued to worsen over the coming days, and he passed away on the 19th of April at 1 a.m. at the age of 55. Right up to the end, he was surrounded by multiple police officers clad in military issue body armor, armed with submachine guns and automatic rifles. Even as he had one foot in the grave, no risks were taken, proving he truly was Hong Kong's most dangerous man. Legacy. As discussed earlier, Yip Kai Foon came to achieve something of a folkloric status during his life, and this reputation is, has only continued to grow after his death as clear memories of his brutal crime slip further and further into the annals of myth. Fans of Yip, it's like, yeah, I guess they, they were brutal. They were like super armed robberies, and he tried to shoot police officers. But just compared to the last two episodes that I recorded, I'm like, this guy's a kind of funny criminal. And you're like, no, Simon, he's not. He's a bad dude. Fans of Yip Kai Foon will paint him as a battered and downtrodden everyman who snapped in the face of a deeply plutocratic system and only ever targeted wealthy people and businesses who had money to lose anyway. Certainly, one man who would disagree is James Elms, who had the following to say about the man. Yip Kai Foon, as far as I'm concerned, is no different from any other criminal. He did it for money. He didn't do it as Robin Hood did to distribute to the poor. On the flip side, then, local legislator Lung Yi Chung, who met with Yip Kai Foon many times from 2005, has quite a positive takeaway of him and believed him to be a reformed man. On the matter, he stated the following, quote, I was very surprised when I received a letter from Yip Kai Foon because I never think that this guy would send me a letter and I didn't know what he wants. From his face, you can't tell he's a bad guy. He was very nice. He was very kind as well. And when you talk with him, he's very polite because he has a wife and daughter in mainland China and he really wants to stay together with them. So he said, is there any possibility for him to have the early release? He said, he wants to be a good husband, a good father, and a good man in the future. His daughter is studying very well in school and wants to be a lawyer in the future. And he said he wants to be a happy family in the future. Then chaplain at Stanley Prison, Tobias Branner, also had a very sympathetic view of the man, stating the following, There is genuine repentance in prison, definitely. There are people who are suffering under the weight, under the burden of the crime that they have committed. They know very much that they have brought pain and suffering on another family, on their own family also. I have baptized Yip Kai Foon in prison, and I believe I wouldn't have done it if he had not turned to Christianity. Personally, as someone who grew up in agonizing poverty, dressed in all but rags and with holes in my shoes, it's certainly easy to glamorize Yip Kai Foon on an emotional level, particularly when the, in the context of the crippling inequality that gripped Hong Kong in the 1990s. But ultimately, I personally must dismiss these emotional notions and focus on the fact that it was a violent, brutal criminal. George, your life is such a mystery. 
Uh, Yip Kai Foon had no issues risking killing when it stood in between him and his goals, and every single police officer, jewelry store clerk, and member of the public who ever had the muzzle of an AK-47 pointed them. All had family members eagerly waiting for their return home, who didn't reser- deserve to become the victim of a Rolex-loving armed robber. Correspondingly, once again, I believe it is only fair that no matter how exciting his tale might have been, that we remember him as the violent criminal that he was. So what do you, the beautiful, handsome, worldly, big wrinkled brains in the audience think? Maybe I'm missing a valuable perspective that would make me see things differently. Let us know down in the comments. I think, from my, from my perspective, I think I've illustrated it plenty of times throughout this episode. It's like, yeah, he's a bad dude. He's an armed robber. He risks shooting police officers and clerks, and he scared the shit out of people. But it's also like he's not as bad as the other guys, is he? <laughs> ah. It feels so light compared to the other stuff. Dismembered appendices. One. I. George, got a bit carried away with the research on this one, to be honest with you. I found Yip Kai Foon's story so fascinating that I become somewhat engrossed by his crazy life. I always try to visit archives and use primary documentation as much as possible in my scripts, like a legend, George, but may have got a bit overboard with this one and researched it to the standard that I normally reserve for my academic work. Correspondingly, many thanks and acknowledgements need to be proclaimed for the various people and organizations that made this script possible. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Hong Kong Police Force Data Access Department for being exceptionally accommodating for my constant nagging and pestering for information. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank the Hong Kong Police Old Comrades Association and the Royal Hong Kong Police Association who were able to put me in direct communication with officers involved in this case or their surviving families. Furthermore, I'd like to thank Officer James Elms for submitting to a sit-down interview and being most welcoming and accommodating in the- You sup! George, you legend! You buried the lead, man! That's great! How exciting! That's so cool! Uh, and being most welcome and accommodating. Furthermore, I'd like to thank Television Broadcast Limited for allowing access to their archives and the product- producers of Hong Kong's King of Thieves for blowing the dust off their raw interview footage and forwarding it to me. George, I am very impressed. I have to say I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope, I mean, I thank you. I hope the audience. That's a lot of work. Oh my God, I feel bad just sitting here and reading it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two. It's something I am noticing more and more with every script I produce for Simon and the Casual Criminalist, but when researching Yip Kai Foon, I encountered a hell of a lot of contradictory discourse and popular discussion of the man's life. I've done all I can to sort the proverbial wheat from the chaff, but I will hold my hands up and admit that mistakes may have been made. Where possible, I deferred to primary documentation of Yip Kai Foon's life. Failing that, I fell back on seemingly well-cited secondary documentation. In the absence of satisfactory secondary documentation, I generally sided with Chinese over English sources, except in cases where the Chinese story seemed flatly unbelievable or absurd. I'm lucky enough to be able to read Chinese, or read it as well as any foreigner ever can, and I was taught at university always defer to the original language source when possible, as it removes one potential layer of error and misunderstanding depending upon someone else's translation. Number three, because I'm currently in possession of my own body weight in primary documentation <laughs> relating to Yip Kai Foon, I feel the urge to do something more with it and, I, and explain his story in a more detailed and comprehensive manner. I was thinking maybe I could put together a book in which I dissect every minute detail of the man's documented life. Just do it. Let me know in the comments if this is something you may like. I have a publisher in China who likes me and owes me a favor. Plus, I'm not going to lie. I'm quite partial to money. <laughs> well, George, you write that book um, and I will promote the absolute shit out of it for you because that sounds really cool and I'd like to see your research go places further. That's great. Do it. I mean, <laughs> I think it sounds interesting, but then again, I host a podcast about this stuff, so I'm bound to. But I reckon that would go well. And they got built in promotion via this show. Love it. Number four, one of the major problems I encountered in completing this script was that there was simply too much to talk about, which I know there are worse problems to have as a writer. Still, I have had to cut out or only quickly mention lots of crazy stories which more than warranted further extrapolation in themselves. I opted to focus on a few of the more crazy heists and confrontations in detail to give you, the audience, a flavor of just how daring and insane they were and instead try to build the rest of the script around the major developments and changes in Yip Kai Foon's life, as well as trying to put more of the focus on some of the brave officers who finally brought him to justice. Hopefully you're all happy with how I've put this one together. I couldn't be more happy, George. I'm a little bit blown away. Um, thank you so much for the strong effort. And yeah, I don't know, you got all that research. That book sounds pretty good. I'd buy that. I'd read that. I'd promote that. 
Let George know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube what you think. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please do consider leaving us a review. That would be fantastic. Five stars. Ah, ah, is preferred, but you can be honest. It's okay. <laughs> uh, like this, subscribe. Thank you for watching or listening. I feel bad as I slip on my slippers that I've been recording this episode in <laughs> while George is out there interviewing people. <laughs>